Now in this example we have a uniformly distributed load. This may arise from a condition where a deck perhaps is spanning perpendicular to the structure and we'll talk about this in a separate lecture but it may be that in a framing plan there is an opening for example a an elevator shaft or something like that and this may be open but then the deck is spanning from beam to beam and so we end up with this portion of the load being transferred onto this beam. So this is a beam over here and this is a beam over here. Assuming this is a spandrel condition, there's nothing on the right hand side this is the space between the beams. And we say that half of that load is going to one and half the load is going to the other. And again, this will be a separate video on tributary widths of beams and loads. So this type of loading would produce this type of load on a beam. Now, what's different here between this and a concentrated load is that the load is distributed along a length. So this is three kips per foot, so every foot of length of the beam we've added three kips. So for a 10 foot length, our total load, which we use as a big W, is our little w times the length that we're spanning, or three kips per foot, times 10 feet feet are going to cancel, 30 kips. Now that 30 kips acts through the centroid of the mass. So if we're talking about a uniform load, just think about a simple rectangle. The balance point of that rectangle is through the middle. So a total weight would tend to act through the middle of the block here. So the same thing is true over here. We have effectively the total weight, we're going to say P equivalent, is 30 kips. Now it's important to understand though that this beam with the distributed load is not the same as putting one concentrated load of 30 kips onto this this would behave entirely differently. The end reactions will be the same, but the internal response of the beam is much worse in this case than it is in this case. So I draw this in with a dashed line just to remind me that this is the position of the load, the equivalent centroid of the load, but not a real load. It's distributed along the length. Now if we were to actually do this the full-blown method, we would actually be doing an integration using calculus and taking an infinitesimal slice of each one of these loads for every small distance and then adding them up. This is essentially the same result uh, by a shorthand method, we could say. So the distance here to the middle of this load is going to be 5 feet here because it's halfway between the 10 and 15 plus another 5 feet or 20 feet here. And that will be important, I'll shade that in a little bit, that will be important when we do our moment calculation. So let's sum this, uh, let's do this by summing moments. I'm going to again use my left hand end as a moment center. So I say sum of the moments about the left are equal to zero. And when we convert this to an equivalent concentrated load, it simply becomes a one-term, well, two-term equation that we have a left-hand or equivalent load here. We have left-hand reaction and right-hand reaction. And we look at the rotations of each of those. So I've got relative to the left-hand point here, I have 30 kips at 5 feet. So the 30 kips, this is my 
P equivalent, which is equal to W times L, or 3 kips per foot times 10 feet. So that's its moment arm from the left hand end, 5 feet. If I call clockwise positive, this would have a rotational tendency of going clockwise, the making it positive. The right hand side would have a counterclockwise rotation making it negative, so that would be minus our right vertical times 25 feet equals zero, so our right vertical We have 30 times 5, 150 kip feet. And we divide that by 25 kip feet. 25 feet, I'm sorry. Feet will cancel and 150 divided by 25 is 6 kips. Now let's sum moments about the right hand end to get the left hand reaction. And as I mentioned in another video, I strongly re recommend that when you're learning this that you actually sum moments about both ends because I can now go to vertical equilibrium because I only have one unknown force, the right hand or left hand reaction. However, if I've made a mistake over here, I also will make a mistake over here. By summing moments on the right hand side, I can assure that these two are correct. And it's one of the nice things about this subject. As long as this is true, your answer is correct, or pretty sure it's correct anyway because all linear and rotational actions add up to zero. So this time I'm going to sum moments about the right hand side equal to zero. I'll again call clockwise positive. So now this is our moment center. So we're looking to this distance, the 20 feet. Remember it's to the centroid of this mass, so 5 feet from the center, 15 plus 5 20 feet. So I have my 30 kips. This is again my P equivalent. Its moment arm, as we said, is 20 feet. Now, this rotational tendency is counterclockwise relative to this point. I've called clockwise positive, so this is a negative 30. And then I have our left vertical it would relatively rotate to this point relatively clockwise, so it's positive, because I've called that positive, and its moment arm is 25 feet equals zero. So this rotation down is balanced by that rotation up. So this is 600 kip feet divided by 25 feet. Feet are going to cancel. Twenty-four kips is our left vertical. Now to verify this, if I sum forces vertical, What I end up with is minus 30 kips, which again is actually 3 kips times 10 feet, plus our left vertical plus our right vertical equals 0. In other words, 30 kips equals our left vertical plus our right vertical, which equals 24 kips plus 6 kips equals 30 kips. It checks. It's OK. So we have confirmed our solution. 
Now let's do a quick verification of this by graphics. So I'm going to treat this just like it was a concentrated load, keeping in mind that an actual load of 30 kips at this point is very different than a distributed load. This is only for the reactions. When we do beam design later on in structures two, we will not use a distributed load if there's a concentrated load. We will not use a concentrated load if there's a distributed load. This is only for reactions. So I'm going to carry down my line of action of these forces. Try to get this as accurate as I can. I'm going to draw it down here. So now the 10 feet, this is not drawn to scale here, so I want to try and be accurate on this. So we'll divide this line in two just by using the ruler here. <coughs> Turning this on an angle, I'll split this in half right here. That's my line. Now I'm suddenly realizing I have no idea how accurate that is proportionally. Um, so let's let's see how well this works here. So I draw my load line using A, B, and C as my points. A is the space here, B is the space here, and C is between my two vertical reactions. So I'm going to squeeze it into this little space right here. I need to fit in 30 kips. So we want to find a scale that actually is viable for this. It needs to be big enough, but not too big. use a 20 scale. So there's my 30 at 1 to 20 scale right here. So this is point A, point B. We'll just pick a point out here somewhere. Now we transfer these lines over toward the line of action of the forces. This is our closing string. So this is point C, and let's see how accurate this came out to be. And it looks like it's pretty good. This looks like six kips. There's five. It's slightly higher than five, about six kips. And then this is right on 24 kips. So that checks. So this makes sense that most of the load is on the left-hand side, so most of the reaction would carry most of that. So we should be able to do both of these uh, fairly swiftly, whether you're doing a graphic or analytic solution.